So thank you for the introduction and also thank you to the organizers for having me as well as um, you know, the audience members for being interested in this talk. Um, I'm very excited to be here and uh, share with you some of the work we've been thinking about over the last few years. And I would say that the um, consistent theme with this particular presentation is in stochastic process frameworks applied to study the tumor immune interaction. Um, given that this is a you know, tipping point conference, I'll talk about some sort of criticality behavior that we've recently been studying. Um, and uh, this will all of course happen after some background and, and some introduction into some of the modeling that we've been um, doing as of recently. So um, everybody can see this. So I have put up here as some motivation, um, US statistics, but the general theme and problem with cancer is that it continues to be a tremendous health burden on you know, our medical, um, our medical uh, infrastructure. And in particular, there, there are several reasons for this. One reason is because, you know, appropriately, more and more sophisticated treatments are coming out. Uh, these are causing people to live longer. And uh, living longer with cancer doesn't necessarily mean having a more affordable care, right? So these patients undergo chronic therapy. Um, the other issue, too, is that as an aging population survives cardiovascular-related uh, morbidity and death events, uh, cancer begins to become more of a problem. Uh, to make matters worse, uh, there's another sort of issue here, which is that while we're doing better and we've had recent improvements in treating many different cancer subtypes over the last, I would say, decade or two, we're still doing a very poor job at treating durably cancer when it's in its advanced form. And so once cancers have metastasized to different you know, organ compartments, uh, we're still doing very poultry on the, on the ability to, to contain this. And so this is sort of the motivation behind the work that, that we think about uh, from a theoretical and applied perspective. Now, just as a sort of overview of, of cancer as a complex system, I like to take this uh, hallmarks of cancer figure. This is sort of now classic from um, Hanahan and Weinberg uh, that sort of describe all of the detailed at high level, all of the detailed ways in which a cancer population could outsmart or avoid uh, the mechanisms that are sort of preventing it from becoming aggressive, uh, dividing, maybe escaping. All of these, if you look at them sort of directly or indirectly relate to, in some way to escape. Um, for this you know, perspective of this talk, we're going to be exclusively referring to this one hallmark, which is avoiding immune destruction. So uh, sort of a necessary condition, if you will, for a tumor to escape is to avoid being killed by the host immune system. It turns out that the host immune system can play um, a recently appreciated role in controlling cancer, but of course the host immune system isn't complete in doing this, otherwise we wouldn't have a problem um, with, with cancer in the clinic. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to um, spend a little brief time talking about at the high level, the most relevant part of the immune system that is important for my work. Uh, and this is uh, the T cell compartment. So T cells form a subset of the adaptive immune system. The goal of an ad adaptive immune system in contrast with a passive uh, compartment is for the system to recognize something that has yet to be discovered. It's a variable identity. To control that threat, and then to develop some sort of memory so that were that threat to appear again in the future, it could be capably cleared. And you can imagine that um, reintroduction of a pathogen like a virus or a bacterium would be effectively handled in this way, even though the immune system may not know at birth, for example, that such a threat exists. Now, there are different parts to this adaptive immune system. T cells are, are one very specific part that I'm going to be focusing on. And in particular, we're talking about CD8 positive or cytotoxic T cells. So these are the T cells that basically their job is to go around surveying your, your, your own cells and making a decision of, you know, as to whether or not those cells look normal, healthy, or if they look infected. If they look infected, the T cell destroys these cells and in doing so prevents a viral or intracellular pathogen from growing out of control. The key to this uh, behavior is through this molecule called the T cell receptor. And although this cartoon is, is quite a, an oversimplification of the process, uh, it sort of characterizes the key uh, ingredients needed for some of the modeling we've done. So 
We have many T cell clones in our body, each of which has a unique receptor. And the goal is for these receptors to bind a molecule uh, called the major histocompatibility or MHC plus one molecule on the surface of normal cells where there's a presented signature. This is a nine to 11 amino acid uh, peptide, a linear digested fragment of the proteins that are inside this cell. And the T cells receptor needs to sort of interrogate this and make a decision as to whether or not this looks normal or not normal. And as I said before, there's a, a, a killing signal. So this uh, extreme diversity of the T cell receptors in our body allow the adaptive immunity to basically hone in on a diverse array of potentially unseen targets. Uh, and this is important in viral, bacterial, intracellular, bacterial infections. And as it turns out, we now appreciate that this is also important in targeting cancer as well. Because like a virus, sometimes during the mutational process in cancer, um, there, there are generated tumor-associated antigens. You can think of maybe the easiest case would be that the mutational events during cancer progression alter peptides that were normally self, but now they don't look like self anymore because they've been, they've been altered by maybe a point mutation or worse. These can be targeted. Um, more subtly, sort of the um, disruption to normal cellular processes in cancer can indirectly put self-peptides on the surface that are presented out of context. So it means that they're normally never seen or maybe they're not seen in the precise abundance that a tumor is presenting. These, while well, self-peptides, will look like non-self-signatures, so they can also be targeted. And here's a, just, a, I think, a beautiful example, an electron microscopy, of a cancer cell being attacked by you know, four of these uh, T cells. Presumably this uh, interaction is, is occurring here and the T cells are recognizing some tumor associated antigen um, and sending killing signals to this tumor population, hopefully killing the cell. Um, so that's the background on the, the T cell uh, receptor part of this. And if I fast forward here, the motivation for all of this is that tumor T cell associated immunotherapies are ones that utilize this anti-tumor effect of the T cells and enhance it to try to you know, eliminate or mitigate the, the disease burden. And I'm just going to just cover three examples that are peripherally relevant to this talk. Um, so for illustration purposes, the first case is a tumor antigen vaccine therapy. This would work very uh, similar to, for example, a normal vaccine, right? The hope would be that in injecting um, tumor associated antigen in high abundance, you're essentially stimulating an immune system that has a T cell that can recognize one of these tumor antigens um, to be, become activated and then target the cancer. Um, a very precise and targeted therapy is chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cell therapy. So this is a sophisticated therapy where clinicians will and, and scientists will identify a target that they want to attack on a cancer with high specificity. They'll genetically engineer that T cell receptor to only attack this one location. And then these engineered T cells will be introduced into the body. And uh, you know, like a laser, they'll hone in very specifically on that target. Uh, the, you know, this has received a lot of success in some cases, although uh, autoimmunity tends to be an issue with, with this treatment. And I think you know, one of the most remarkable treatments and relevant to this sort of diverse nature of the T cell population is hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So here, we're taking an entire donor-derived immune system consisting of millions, if not billions of T cells, and we're introducing it into the cancer patient with the hope that this new immune system will have a chance at targeting one of those antigens that was detected, or, or failed, I should say, to be detected by the host immune system. This is actually very important and has given durable treatment in leukemia, and in particular, this is a mainstay of treatment for chemotherapy resistant acute myeloid leukemia. Um, I like to contrast these two because of the specificity here of a single honing in target, very much like targeted or blockade therapy. And uh, this is just kind of a shotgun approach enlisting the entire resources available to a donor derived repertoire. Okay, and so the, I think the last background slide that I'd, I'd like to cover today involve some of the dynamics uh, that, that make cancer uh, killing very challenging. So we've, we've known for a long time that 
uh, adaptive uh, threats, and cancer is in this category uh, definitively, can evolve mechanisms of evasion that make targeting them very challenging. The biggest issue with cancer is that traditional therapies like chemotherapy directed at one pathway or maybe a small number of pathways often uh, get circumvented by this acquired or preexistent evolution. So here's a picture in time, a very nice graphic um, of the um, tumor burden as the, the graph gets wide of acute myeloid leukemia prior to and following chemotherapy here. Uh, and what you can see in the colors are subclones that have emerged in route to this treatment and um, sort of gross apparent disease. And already it's a pretty bleak picture, right? Because <clears throat> what this is telling us is that if you track the subclonal burdens in this tumor, there's already a clone that exists prior to even conceiving of giving therapy that gets essentially selected for by this therapy and then grows and continues to, to evolve to develop even more fitness advantage in spite of the chemotherapy. So this is a very big problem. And this is one of the reasons why most targeted therapies fail in cancer. Now, as I said before, if we're enlisting you know, either a donor or your own entire adaptive immune system, we're essentially allowing the cancer to be targeted by many different locations, right? Many different um, signatures that may be presented. And the hope would be that this is a bit more aggressive. But of course, it's not a silver bullet because we still have cancer. And as it turns out, um, cancer can utilize immune specific evasion mechanisms, much like it can traditional chemotherapeutic resistance mechanisms to avoid uh, targeting. The most obvious one I can think of based on the previous introduction slides that I gave for illustration purposes is if a tumor population will actually downregulate or entirely you know, mutate away that MHC class one presenting molecule. If that happens, there's no way that that signature can ever be recognized by the T cell, right? It's as if the, the signal disappears entirely. So this is an invisible tumor from the standpoint of the, the CD8 T cell repertoire. And actually it, it's rare, but this is known to occur and this would be a durable evasion event. Um, so with that, I'd like to, to, to very briefly talk about some of the random energy model uh, work that we've done to sort of characterize a T cell's receptor's ability to, to recognize cancer. I'm putting these up mostly for the sake of time for, for reference for interested individuals. I'd be happy to talk more about this work um, offline with anyone who's interested. But um, what I wanna just point out is that you can envision this, um, this sort of system as a, a TCR that's interacting with this amino acid fragment that's presented on an MHC. And as it turns out, uh, you know, many colleagues have gone before me. Arup Chakabarty of MIT was one of the earliest to pioneer this work. And, uh, and we've sort of adapted a framework that, that he developed to where we're thinking of the interaction between the T cell receptor and MHC as a constant or you know, non-variable interaction, more or less fixed for each T cell and the MHC isn't changing. And a more interesting variable interaction term that occurs due to the diversity of a T cell receptor and an antigen that's highly varying in the groove. And so using very simple random energy models, we can envision this as a constant plus variable interaction where we're taking you know, some random energies assigned to you know, a typical distribution that you'd think of, either uniform for a min and max interaction or Gaussian energies. And in doing so, we can ask questions like, if this T cell is going to be subject to the education process to avoid targeting self, you don't want autoimmunity, so these T cells get educated, to what effect does this education step impair the recognition of a tumor associated antigen that may look just like self, it's just mutated at one spot. So if this is a 10 amino acid long sequence, a tumor associated antigen that's point mutated is gonna be 90% the same to an antigen we already know the T cell cannot recognize. And the question would be if we could calculate that recognition probability, can we contextualize it to a maximum recognition um, relative to some antigen that's been drawn at random and looks nothing like one of the self peptides. I don't show that uh, work here, this is the reference, but we actually demonstrate that we would predict that even though they share 90% similarity, about 70% of the recognition potential of a completely random antigen is recognized just by making a point mutation. And that supports, in a sense, the, the, the robust uh, sort of recognition capacity for T cells against these tumor associated antigens. 
Now, something that we've done sort of in moving forward, uh, and this is the bottom part of this slide, is we've now moved to make this more um, data friendly and, and facing sort of the bioinformatics, uh, I guess, world where we could actually train a model that uses this random energy framework against known systems where we have an idea for you know, how the systems interact. So in these cases, <clears throat> the approach we've opted to take is to use known crystal structures. These are structures where we have the peptide uh, loaded on an MHC interacting with a T cell. We know these are strong interactions and we get the pairwise interactions on the amino acid um, moieties for each T cell receptor and peptide. And from this, we can create, a, a, in a sense, a contact map that describes you know, the, as a function of amino acid position along T cell and peptide, where the interactions occur. In doing this then, we can use these contact maps that are crystal structure dependent to train an optimized energy, pairwise energy model for resolving the, the sort of entropic difference between strong binders and decoy weak binders. In doing so, the overall hope would be that model could, you know, in a sense, be trained on a subset of the data we have available due to the sparsity and, and the I guess high complexity and dimensionality of these, these systems to be able to make a prediction um, more reliably on the uh, recognition pair, whether or not there's a strong binding event for T cells and or peptides that we have not yet encountered in the model. Um, so if any of this work is exciting to you, uh, would love to talk about it more and would feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm actually going to be focusing on these population dynamical models um, of the tumor immune interaction and in particular T cells. So our first stab at this uh, was a few years ago where you know, we, our goal was to sort of develop a minimalistic population dynamical model that would describe this sort of um, rare but disastrous evasion uh, event. And so the way that we envisioned this was um, with a cancer population growing at some net growth rate, by the way, this is uh, using a continuous time you know, birth death model. Uh, the cancer population is going to grow uh, until some minimal detection size uh, above which the immune system may start to have the possibility to recognize tumor. Um, now, in that case, one of several things happens. Either uh, you know, the immune compartment is sort of trying to recognize something but never does, the cancer escapes. Perhaps most optimally, one of the T cells is recognizing a dominant uh, tumor associated signature. That T cell expands and creates incurs a very large death rate on the cancer population. And maybe the most unfortunate scenario is the one where, you know, there's some, you know, adaptive immune evasion that's durable, where there is a T cell that comes along that recognizes the tumor, but not before the acquisition of a durably immune evasive phenotype. And in this foundational model, we're assuming that the cells that are, you know, emerging from this, um, you know, evasive uh, behavior are completely invisible to the immune system afterwards. So, there's no hope of, of targeting this with, with prior T, or I should say, uh, future T cells. In doing this, we've characterized the dynamics of the, the cancer. There's a you know, per cell division adaptive evasion event. This is taken to be very small to represent rare but catastrophic evasion. And on the immune system arm, we have um, sort of two, two features that we're modeling. One is the current T cell diversity. That is the number of total T cells that you have that you could potentially recognize a tumor with. Um, and we sort of represent this by a uh, clearance probability. So the more diverse your repertoire is, the higher the chance that you recognize something when it matures to detection size. Now, if you have no T cells that can recognize something at detection size, perhaps you get a new T cell later that can recognize it. Your, our bodies are constantly creating more T cells. So we create this turnover parameter that is sort of Poisson distributed to Poisson arrival uh, with some uh, time in the foundational model time homogeneous rate k. Generalities can, can assume you know, differences in this k as a function of time. Um, and in using this model, we're able to, I mean, the, the, the beauty of a foundational model is in many times you can create analytical um, expediency to, to get some information on the process. So we've done this. I mean, with the simplicity of this model, some of the, the mathematical theory that's available to us is characterizing in closed form the probability of that um, sort of undesirable event occurring. And we can, we can write this as a function of the, the parameters that have just been described. Another thing we can do to first order in mu uh, with a Taylor expansion is characterize the mean escape time, which is also another important clinical parameter for studying you know, the, the length of time one might expect 
to have to wait before the emergence of one of these um, amino evasive clones. And in applying this to real world data, I think the, the, the easiest or most direct way to do that would be to look for data where we have some information on how the immune system might change in time, right? So immune diversity and turnover both decline as a function of age. As it turns out, turnover rates uh, fall precipitously and you know, actually pretty, pretty early on, maybe by you know, 30 years of age with preserved diversity until advanced age when even your diversity hits. So using this model and just simply you know, imputing known turnover in T cell diversity declines, we're actually able to very well characterize AML specific immune incidence assuming that cancer risk of incidence or initiation is constant for all ages. And we compare this to you know, sort of the canonical multi-hit model of tumor incidence that assumes that N statistically independent hits need to arrive prior to tumor um, escape. We already see that you know, we're doing a better job in characterizing this sort of diminishing contour in late age. We've also applied this to understand places where people are placed on chronic immunosuppressants. And in those cases, we also can actually predict that those patients are gonna have increased leukemia risks at the 10 year mark simply by being placed on those suppressants in agreement with the, the data. And I don't show that here for the sake of time. Um, now, another direction that you can go is say, well, this simple model only stopped at one evasion event. What if the evasion event itself isn't durable, right? So in other words, instead of losing that MHC molecule altogether, you can envision perhaps maybe the tumor antigen that was presented there is just lost or mutated in a way that's no longer recognized. In that case, you can envision this model that was a continuous time birth death model um, repeating over and over again. And um, you know, for technical detail, or for technical limitations, the way that we analyze this repeating game is to discretize it into a branching process as a function of generational period. In other words, how many of these sort of repeat cat and, cat and mouse chases need to occur before either escape or elimination occurs. And um, the one thing I just wanna point out with this modeling framework is that a lot of the, um, you know, some competing views in the literature um, will question whether or not elimination, escape and equilibrium for the cancer can occur. So the general belief is that all three are possible. There might be a very delicate balance between tumor immune killing, um, immune related death and uh, in the proliferation and evolution of the tumor. Actually, in our model, we find that there's a splitting probability if you, if you actually can characterize the overall chance of elimination or evasion, and only under the wildest and unrealistic assumptions on the ability of the immune system to recognize the threat, uh, is there any chance of having a probability of ultimate uh, equilibrium in the long run? And so we would actually say this, this, this modeling prediction goes against that common thought that given enough time, which actually doesn't require that much time, you're either gonna escape or become eliminated, but we really shouldn't be optimistic that there are cases where the cancer can be carefully you know, kept in check indefinitely. Um, okay, and so with that, I'd like to move on into a more detailed recent model where we've actually built in, um, here it is, we've actually built in explicitly tracking these tumor associated antigens. So the question is if you would consider, uh, you know, sort of a core clonal uh, feature which is immunogenicity of the, the clonal uh, tumors in a minimal sense, the, the number of key antigens that if you were to target one, you'd be able to target most of the cancer, how the interaction with the immune system with this would evolve over time. So this is a cartoon where it may be hard to appreciate uh, from, the, from the audience in the back. There are different colors of these tumor associated antigens that represent different, different signals that could be recognized. And if the immune system in some coarse grain sense of discretized time, can't recognize any of these, the population escapes. And this patient either dies or comes into the clinic and must be treated. Alternatively, if there are T cells that can recognize any of these antigens, uh, the T cells will begin targeting them. So you know, for this uh, cartoon, purple and blue antigens are then being targeted. And now the balls in the cancer population's court, if you will, to downregulate or um, sort of antagonize these targets. Otherwise the cancer gets eliminated. But if the cancer can downregulate these successfully, potentially they downregulate more, but at least at, at the very minimum these, then the cancer can live to see another day. And the new cancer now is, has been immunoedited in a sense because it no longer contains these tumor associated antigens. Our goal of this modeling framework was to explain in a sense, 
the profound level of diversity that exists experimentally with post-escape tumors in their antigenicity profiles. So it's known across many tumor types that patients coming into the clinic may have a cancer that's highly immunogenic, meaning that it can be easily targeted, and also tumors that come in from the same type of cancer, from the same kind of treatment duration or, uh, or even like incubation period of subclinical disease that are actually immunogenically very cold. And it's for this reason that, that we wanted to see if we could explain that, why some are coming in very hot, very cold. Is there some sort of critical behavior that would maybe lend itself to explain this? Um, so in order to uh, handle this, uh, we've considered sort of in this model some probabilistic uh, discrete time process that we can then characterize this, this, um, this behavior. So the process goes as follows. We, the state variable that we're tracking is the number of antigens. That's the number of signals here. And at the a given time point, there's a probability that none of the antigens are recognized by the immune system. If that occurs, then the cancer evades. That of course gets really hard if the cancer has a lot of antigens, right? Uh, one minus uh, gamma here is just the, the probability, one minus the probability of recognition. Alternatively, if, if some recognition occurs, then the cancer needs to downregulate one of the recognized antigens with some probability. It could be fixed or it could be variable, but the cancer has some per antigen likelihood of, of, of evading. If the cancer can't do that, uh, sorry here, so pi and P should be interpreted to be identical here, then the, the cancer can live to see another day. If it can't, then it, it dies. So these two are stopping conditions here. The process will halt and the process will only continue if the sort of recognition and evasion in a sense match. And you know, the number of recognized antigens, R sub n, the number of current antigens, S sub n, being the state variable, and uh, the um, per cell immune recognition probability and the antigen downregulation, this is the tumor evasion probability, are going to be the key parameters here. Um, the only other parameter that matters here is some uh, intertemporal penalty term. So in other words, cancer is evolving, right? It's generating antigens. Well, so there's no, nothing preventing new antigens from arriving tomorrow, right? And you know, this probably is linked directly to the, the level of aggressiveness to which cancer adapts, right? More adaptation can create larger numbers of new antigens that may be targeted later that are invisible today. So this framework lends itself very well to asking questions like, if the immune system were to adopt a fixed, or the tumor adopting a fixed strategy, how does the uh, survival probability and dynamics change versus one where the tumor might be able to adopt a more uh, context specific or even optimized policy. And in order to maybe say why this isn't so crazy, it's long been known, for example, that you know, in, in even simple systems like bacteria, the mutation or in our case, abstract evasion rate can scale with um, you know, some, some sort of stress in the system. So bacteria can, can sort of out evade or generate mutants very quickly that hopefully generates one that's resistant when there's a lot of stress. And it turns out that the same sort of, uh, I would say mechanistic uh, behavior has been seen in cancer too and reported um, you know, to, to, to sort of occur where um, you know, this genetic diversity will occur following treatment which can be seen as sort of a, a pressure if you will on that, that population. And so we consider two cases, one where the tumor evasion rate in that previous framework is fixed. It doesn't depend, I mean, it's, it's taken constant across all of the stochastic trajectories. Um, and in this case, we're gonna assume, you know, that the, the penalty term is, you know, it could be random perhaps, but um, IID. And the alternative, maybe more exotic assumption would be that perhaps there's a variable adaptation rate and um, that the intertemporal penalty term that we see, the arrival of new antigens, uh, is, is perhaps a function of both where we currently are antigenically in most generality, how many are currently being targeted, right? How much is being targeted may represent the inflammation or something in the, in the system, as well as the strategy taken itself. Of course, if, if this uh, doesn't depend on uh, pi sub n at all, you can very quickly see that this breaks because the optimal strategy would just be to always adapt with probability one, and the cancer would always choose that strategy. But if adaptation and surviving today can penalize you by giving more recognition targets tomorrow, now you can see that there may be a trade-off. Um, so to that end, I'll you know, cover some of the model in uh, the fixed case first. Um, 
the mathematics behind this is, is simply recognizing that each of these are IID. And so the number of recognized antigens is gonna be binomially distributed as a function of the total number of antigens available at the present time. And conversely, if this process is trying to avoid those recognized antigens, then conditioned on the number of recognized antigens, the number of lost antigens on the cancer is gonna be binomially distributed with R sub n as the, as the number of trials. And uh, we can characterize the joint distribution of this and conditioning on both um, you know, the number of recognized and lost antigens, we can come up with um, you know, a description of the distribution uh, behavior where we, we can characterize the probability of each of these uh, events occurring. And so in particular, we give these as functions of, uh, or parameters of, of the features that we were most interested in before. So having these probabilities allow us to characterize the transitions. Um, the, one of the questions might be, how does this behave? Uh, well, first before that, you might say, okay, what would the cancer prefer? So you, you can very easily imagine that you might wanna ask as a function of the number of antigen targets available and the, um, the recognition probability, uh, what is the, the evasion probability that you need from the cancer's perspective to break even? That is to have an equal probability of either escape or elimination. And it turns out that this process is largely favoring a recognizing immune system over an evading cancer. The moment that these antigens get uh, anything higher than you know, one or two. And very quickly, if you have more antigens, the, the chance that a tumor is gonna win is, is already low. Unless of course the tumor has overwhelming rec, uh, evasion probability. And that sort of makes sense. You can think of the following game. Envision taking a player where you both have coins you're a recognizing player, I'm an evading player. We each match our coins. Now, you as the recognizer are gonna flip your coins and you're gonna get some heads. As long as you get one head, I, I can't win. If you get all tails, I win because I escape. But if you get at least one head amongst those coins, which becomes much more likely as the number of coins arrive, not only do I need to get this, at least the same amount of heads that you do, but I need to match the places where you got a head. And if I don't match all of them, or at least the ones that you have, then I lose. So if you think about that, that sort of game, uh, theoretic, if you will, approach to, to describing this process, this, this becomes quite intuitive. Um, and, and this break-even probability can be characterized, of course, using these parameters. Uh, now, the process, the question is, if, if we're tying in the regime where a tie probability is high, what do the dynamics of the evolution of this look like for the, the antigenicity or the number of total antigens as a function of tie. So uh, for the sake of time, I, I think I'm going to um, start to speed up a little bit here, but the key uh, sort of idea here in, in the takeaway is that for a number of these are representative trajectories where I varied the, um, you know, the, the tumor escape probability and the antigen recognition probability. For, for a majority of these cases, they're stable, for all of these cases considered, there's stable mean reverting behavior that occurs. And in fact, you know, we can characterize the exact mean transition dynamics of this discrete time process. We can also uh, characterize an approximate um, dynamics assuming that the number of antigens recognized takes its mean uh, on the part of the uh, immune system. And these actually uh, result in autoregressive uh, behavior uh, where you know, the entire history of the, the recognition landscape uh, gives you the, the expected number of antigens that converges to a ratio between how many new, it's a balance, how many new antigens you're receiving on average in the next time step divided by the number that you're um, losing in the current time step. So that's, that's sort of the balance. The important point here though, is that there's no, there's no accumulation or depletion in a sense of the dynamics, right? The dynamics are mean reverting, they're stable. So the only way that you can get large uh, antigenicity or small is to have these parameters change wildly across patients with the same disease, of course, you know, you're gonna get in distribution, largely the same antigenicity. So this is why we said, uh, maybe we should be thinking about more adaptive and informed behavior. So moving on to the next part, uh, and for the last, I'll try to respect the time here, maybe five to seven minutes. Um, I wanna present just a sort of a sample of what we've done to consider intelligent or smart adaptation. So, Cancer adaptations most likely, I mean, it has to operate on the spectrum from dumb, uninformed, fixed adaptation. Maybe the even more extreme case of the spectrum is no adaptation, which 
we almost can throw out immediately. But on the other limiting case, informed adaptation to the point where you as a thinker with a brain and looking at this process could fully guess what the best strategy would be if I just told you what was being recognized at each point. So in a sense, this is the most optimized we can get, right? With the hope that cancer probably maybe falls somewhere on this spectrum to, to where maybe we don't necessarily know. But this, this framework is actually more like a financial agent in a market making a decision to maximize some return on their portfolio for it in a sense, right? So this, this, this framework lends itself very well to using dynamic programming as the, as the method to describe both the, the dynamical behavior that's emerging as well as the optimal evasion policy. That is, candidate immune recognition environment, how does the cancer optimally navigate that in a way that maximizes their overall long-term escape probability. Um, so in order to do this, we take our, you know, our discrete time process and uh, we simply assign rewards. We get a reward of zero dollars or units of utility, if you will, if the cancer can't uh, avoid, uh, the recognition is eliminated. We give a unit reward of $1 if the cancer can escape. And there's some time discounting so that if you make it to the next state and you have this process repeat, you'll get another unit reward, but there's some time additive discounting. So a unit of reward today is worth more than a unit of reward tomorrow in the next day and so on. Okay, so with that framework in mind, uh, the, the theoretical uh, approach that we can use is this uh, Bellman framework using the Bellman equations and the principles of dynamic programming, and, and in particular stochastic dynamic programming, to uh, identify a value function. Actually, the value function is the key uh, because it really will relate, uh, in a sense, uh, if we read this, the maximum expected reward over a uh, potentially infinite horizon. So we could have done finite time horizon here as well. Uh, for analytical expediency, we choose an infinite horizon. And in a sense, we're saying that the reward is in the future, you know, a function of all of these parameters, but it's either going to be one or zero with a discounting factor. And we're trying to maximize the sum of expected future rewards. Okay, so there are, you know, well-established uh, equations here that we can use. Backward induction would tell you that if you're considering the maximum attainable expected future rewards, by backward induction, if you start in the future now, one day, and you've already achieved the optimal future reward policy, then to consider what should happen yesterday or today, going back one step in time, should just be what you would expect to have tomorrow, plus whatever the optimal reward is. And so this is the backward induction principle. And using these together, we can write down the Bellman, the famous so-called Bellman equation um, under some uncertainty. Uh, with respect to the value function and each of these pi sub n's, this is the intertemporal evasion probability. Um, now I'm, I'm a little bit, so yeah, probably getting close here. So I may skip a little bit of this. Um, let's see if we can get to sort of the meat of the result. So taking this form, there's oftentimes not solutions. You can simulate this. Um, the goal is to find fixed points of this, uh, you know, this value function uh, backward a dynamic program equation uh, to characterize optimal value as well as the, the policies that derive that optimal value. So this can be handled numerically under a wide variety of assumptions. Um, in, in this case, because the rewards are bounded, it actually makes the problem very nice. Uh, we wanted to analytically characterize this. So we made some more additional assumptions in order to, to make this a bit more tractable, um, namely that the, the, the penalties that we're getting at each period are going to be time homogeneous. There's no proclivity for having more or less penalty, depending on the time. Um, we're going to assume deterministic penalty. In general, you can characterize it by a distribution. And this affine penalty term, meaning that how much new antigen you would expect to receive in the future is going to be directly proportional to how much evasion you have as a cancer. Again, as I told you in the beginning, that's almost necessary because otherwise you should just avoid all the time. But maybe you get penalized for avoiding plus you know, some affine term. And you know, the biggest actually assumption is in the functional form of this linear term. Um, there's actually several classes that, that can work here. Um, one where we have actually one free parameter at every single time point is this uh, maybe kind of ugly looking um, you know, equation. Uh, but really it says that you know, in the asymptotics of large recognition, the 
the scaling on the, the penalty that you receive is proportional to R sub n, the number of recognized antigens. So a tumor that's getting targeted more aggressively will have a harder time escaping without penalty than one that, that isn't. Okay, now for the exciting result, and then um, yeah, we'll finish up. So using this framework, we can actually solve for the value function. We can demonstrate that this value function satisfies the Bellman equation. And in fact, we can prove that this is the unique uh, equation. Using this uh, you know, framework of sort of reverse uh, engineering the, the answer by backward induction. And uh, let me show you again, uh, the mathematical detail actually is, in, it's already uploaded to the archive. Um, but you, know, you can see at least some of these, uh, these contours. So here, um, you know, what we've done is we've plotted the optimal policy as a function of um, one minus the probability of uh, recognition on the immune system. And so you can see when recognition is really aggressive, which is on this side, the optimal evasion strategy of the tumor needs to scale accordingly. Um, additionally, if uh, more things are being recognized, the policy should also optimally be more aggressive, right? The tumor that's being recognized with one antigen or two, three, four should go up. And similarly, this is, this is in the limit where we have an infinite number of antigens. We can solve this per antigenicity as well. Um, now going more toward, you know, thinking back to the original question, which was how does this, you know, how does this work in, in the real world? One thing that might, one might ask is, in addition to this passive recognition that's going on by the immune system, a clinician, uh, you know, is a thinking and um, calculated uh, individual may impose an artificial recognition landscape on the problem, right? If I was a, in the clinic and I was giving T cell therapy, I might be either giving a really aggressive therapy that I sustain. I might try to cycle that therapy. I might try a number of things. All of these recognition landscapes in a sense can be considered and their effects on the optimal decision of the cancer uh, related through the previous framework. And it's of course, perhaps no surprise, but one can quantify then the benefit of an adaptive informed strategy in terms of the long-term evasion probability uh, versus a passive or fixed strategy. And so under all of these uh, artificially imposed recognition landscapes, uh, you can kind of see that the optimized case always outperforms. And moreover, in each of these, I'm, I'm writing uh, the distribution here of escape times. You can see that the battle between the tumor and immune system and all of these cases, maybe save one exception, is more sustained in the optimal case. So an optimal evader in a sense kind of bides their uh, time perhaps navigating more aggressive uh, recognition at one period to live another day to optimally escape tomorrow in a way that maximizes the probability of that escape. So that's, that's sort of the takeaway. Now, uh, one thing we can also ask is questions like, is aggressive targeting really good? I mean, if you recognize things with a high probability, that should be good. Uh, you should kill the cancer aggressively. Well, the answer actually turns out maybe to be counterintuitive. So, well, it's true that if you recognize everything with certainty, the cancer dies, there's no hope. But conditional on not recognizing the cancer with a high recognition probability, uh, these are histograms of the number of available antigens following this escape as we ramp up that recognition probability. So if we're really aggressively you know, targeting this cancer, we actually deplete the antigens that are available in the clinic in the future to, to recognize the tumor. Uh, similarly, an immune environment in any individual with a growing cancer that has aggressive recognition will have heavy immunoediting and leave very few tumor-associated antigens to target. Um, and this is, again, suggestive and consistent with active immunoediting. Uh, the last thing that I want to say, again, this is a tipping point conference. So um, here, the dynamical behavior is actually a little bit more interesting is it turns out there's a critical recognition probability on the immune system's end where if you have recognition above that, that is aggressive, effective, uh, maybe tumor infiltrated recognition, you in fact, with the optimal dynamics, recover the mean reverting behavior, just like we saw in the passive case. But not always. If the recognition is sufficiently impaired, this equilibrium point no longer becomes stable and trajectories for the antigen profiles of these tumors conditional on tying during the process as it either escapes or eliminates become either enriched or depleted, which was very surprising to us. And again, this is more consistent with the picture that, that occurs in the clinic where a number of patients will come in and have very hot, immunogenically hot, many antigens, tumors, and cold, 
where you have no hope of targeting them. And this is behavior that only came about assuming a dynamic evasion strategy, not a passive one. Um, the, sign, the sign of the equilibrium is also a factor that determines uh, based, basically the penalty of the um, adaptive uh, intertemporal number of antigens that are arriving this uh, H sub B. And we can very quickly, this is sort of my last uh, slide, partition this into various cases, depending on the immune microenvironment we're describing. That is some cancers may pay a higher penalty for evasion if they're being actively targeted, maybe. Uh, maybe the environment is helping them so they don't have to be penalized as much for adaptation. These are sort of pro-tumor immune microenvironments. And similarly, infiltrated immune microenvironments versus excluded will have very different abilities of the immune system to even go in and recognize. And so if we look at sort of partitioning the tumor microenvironment, if you will, into those cases, um, we have very different immunogenicity profiles that, that can emerge. Uh, you know, you can see infiltrated pro-tumor IME, this is being depleted. So this means that there's active immune targeting, but the tumor is not paying a high price for that targeting. The number of antigens that you have available are, are, are none, right? And there are other cases where, where that's very different. Um, so this leads to the last uh, image, which is just, um, you can envision a tumor that's sort of stably evolving, if you will, with an infiltrated anti-tumor immune microenvironment. And features in the immune microenvironment may result in exclusion of the T cells, barriers, physical or chemical barriers that prevent new T cells from coming in, um, as well as the tumor um, alteration of the microenvironment to, in a sense, uh, mitigate its penalty as it adapts. And so all of these things can then lead to dynamical behavior where you have sort of explosion of antigenicity. This is likely to escape. You're going to see it in the clinic, but you can target it at least. Um, this one, uh, maybe it's rare that it escapes, but if it does, you have no hope of treating it. And then this very interesting intermediate case where, again, based on the criticality of that recognition um, regime, you can actually have very different behavior based on the initial state of that antigenicity where the, the flip occurs. And so with that, I, I think I'll follow up by just briefly saying that, you know, obviously we're taking this model now and we're going to be comparing it to real tumor data and trying to understand maybe why in, in the observed clinical data, we have these hot and cold tumors with hopefully a way then to argue uh, from an applied perspective, why it might make sense to try to alter the immune microenvironment and how one might alter that complex environment to maximize uh, killing the tumor. And I think the theoretically very interesting question here is, we assumed optimal evasion. The tumor cells don't have a human brain. But optimal evasion described the system better than passive evasion. So there's a general question of to what extent is adaptation optimized? And that's, I think, the interesting theoretical question that we would like to continue developing in a variety of contexts moving forward. And with that, I'll thank you all for your uh, attention and interest. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, the collaborators, my, my new group, as well as my uh, advisor, and the funding agencies that made um, this work possible. Uh, I know these are very hard to read. Uh, if this is being uploaded to YouTube, maybe uh, leaving it on here will, will help. But if any of this work is interesting to you, uh, please feel free to reach out and, and can send it along. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful talk. I have a couple of questions. Sure. First, initially you've shown a contact match between this tumor and T cell. Uh, can you please explain it a little bit more? And second thing, uh, you've explained that uh, this uh, therapy of uh, interaction between T cells and uh, T cell and uh, this tumor cells actually does not work for all the patients. So is it, uh, has it something to do with the mutations in the uh, tumor or uh, there are more layers to it? Yes, okay, so the first question, this is the contact map you're referring to. So this is a map that describes if, if I have an antigen, it could be a tumor antigen, it could be a, a viral antigen, it could be a self antigen. This is the uh, playbook, the rules of engagement, if you will, on how the T cell is going to see that antigen. So, pardon me. Um, you can already appreciate that, uh, you know, certain positions in this antigen, right, these are amino acid positions, are going to be more seen by a higher number of contacts by the TCR. Uh, and some positions are less important, right? Here, uh, maybe here, this antigen is only making contact with one TCR amino acid. So this framework is really uh, a way to relate a weighting of the importance of those contacts in a spatial 
a spatially consistent way that's informed by the crystal structure. I don't know if that helped. Uh, I'm sorry, was, was that the extent of the question was clarification or? No, I just wanted to understand, thanks. But second question is, uh, you, you said this uh, therapy actually does not work for all the patients. That's right, yeah. So uh, by therapy, these T-cell immunotherapies. Uh. Um, yeah, and your, your uh, I guess, qu follow-up question to that was, is it just in the immunogenicity? Is there more going on? The short answer is there's a lot more going on. There are other ways that tumor cells can be targeted by the immune system. This is a dominant effect. Um, there are other natural killer cells is another adaptive immune cell that, that is affecting this. Um, all of this assumes that T cells are adequately primed to be uh, ready to go after a target. That requires additional helper T cells that can co-stimulate these T cells. And perhaps based on the talk and maybe the, uh, the bias that I've introduced from my belief, uh, it should be no surprise that all of these additional features can be uh, sort of held hostage and uh, remolded by the tumor to facilitate escape. So tumors can deplete the metabolic environment, depriving uh, immune cells from key nutrients even that would allow them to activate. So even if the signal exists, those immune cells are so discouraged, if you will, or exhausted that they don't, they don't, uh, they don't work. Other times the, the tumor itself will overexpress inhibitory molecules to not activate a T cell. So a T cell recognizes things, but it's so discouraged again that, that, it, that it no longer recognizes. Uh, so immune checkpoint blockade therapy, PD, you know, PD-L1, PD-1 uh, therapy, as well as CTLA-4 uh, checkpoint blockade therapy. These are the, actually some of the ones that have gotten the most uh, fame uh, for simply removing breaks on T cell activation. And those allow, once that happens, T cells can go wild. But yeah, the, it's incredibly complicated. Uh, this is just one very small uh, aspect of, of everything that's going on. Thank you. Yeah. So in your uh, means in your talk, actually you have discussed many equations, but a uh, lot of parameters are there. So how have you parameterized those um, equations, means models? Can I? Say yeah. That? Yeah. Absolutely. So I think uh, well, this is this is a statistical mechanics based approach. The these equations are generated by random variables. There's actually a lot of simplicity here that doesn't require this. Some of the other models I showed, the population dynamical models have more features. I would even argue though that these features are quite minimalistic. So maybe the, the most obvious case is probably not too far is, is something like this, where um, you know we have, uh, there it is. We have a statement about a per cell evasion rate, the lower limit of detection, the death rate, and the, sorry, this is the T cell killing rate and the tumor per cell growth rate. These are, these are derived, yeah, these are closed form solutions derived from the, the process. The simplicity of this process, right? There's a lot we ignore, but the reason why we do it this way is because we can gain some theoretical understanding. And the, I think the overall goal is that, uh, you know, many clinicians would argue that this, well, maybe this is surprising that so few items can be used to describe incidents. But in reality, I think it's going to be adapting and embellishing models like this with you know, more realistic features that then become analytically intractable. So if they're analytically intractable, we, we sort of can no longer do this, but this gives us a first stab. So that's actually, I think, complementary to your question. This is actually advocating for more complexity. So this I'm saying, probably this is as simple as we can get by staying relevant. But even in these cases, you know, where we have say, four or five parameters. These are informed largely by the tumor we're seeing or, or considering. So uh, just as an example, because I have it here, AML, it's known, for example, that AML has one of the lowest mutation rates. And therefore, we could kind of consider mutation and evasion to be reflective of one another. So we can impute an evasion rate by what has been observed experimentally. AML growth rate is also known. Um, the things that are sort of less known here maybe are the minimal size at which a tumor can be targeted as well as the killing rate. But uh, the behavior is largely the same so long as R is much lower than D. 
Um, and so really there's, there's sort of one dimension, if you will, of uncertainty in a, an equation like this. Uh, going forward to maybe the optimal, the optimal, um, and, that's, and that's really it. I didn't have time to explain this, but P star, and so P star is, uh, if it will go back, it's actually a, a function of all of those other um, parameters that I just showed. The only difference being that the mu no longer is being seen to be a per cell like complete evasion, but it's sort of a transient evasion event. So all of those can then be sort of generalized in this context. So same number of equations and complexity here. Um, this is a little bit different, right? Because here we're, we have a lot going on and the, the question is you wanna be able to sort of generate the framework from the most general case and then figure out what's minimal assumptions are needed to solve it. From there, then we had, uh, oh, maybe it's a little bit blurry. From there, then we, we have these, these various parameters. The dynamics of the model are, are generated by S sub N, um, but things like, you know, uh, if it will catch up with uh, theoretical expediency, we are assuming that to, to characterize the model, but more work would certainly be needed to sort of pin those down in applying it to, to real data. Um, however, that being said, these sort of critical transitions behaviors that we see with effective versus non-effective recognition should be something that could be very easily uh, seen in maybe extreme cases where we have a good idea that the cancer has no hope of recognizing, uh, or the immune system no hope of recognizing cancer simply because T cells are being excluded actively from the environment. So this exists with um, you know, uh, lung cancer and breast cancer melanoma as well. Uh, the three-dimensional architecture of that tumor can prevent uh, in immune infiltration. And in leukemia, the one that I was talking about before, it's not true, right? Leukemia is a blood, a cancer of the blood. So the immune, the immune cells and cancer are in a sense mixing. Uh, so there the recognition probability should be quite high. And uh, using, I think sort of uh, it, the first, uh, I, I would say attempt at uh, connecting to real data arguments like this, we could, we could make some characterization of the distribution of uh, immunogenicity we would expect in, in both cases. Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Not let's thank Jason once again and we'll break for. <laughs>